안녕하세요. 미국 주시론 대학이 미준입니다. 지루한 미국 증시의 하락장이 지난 몇 달에 걸쳐서 진행되고 있습니다. 이렇게 오랜 시간 동안 미국 증시가 하락세를 보이는 것은요. 어떻게 보면 매우 당연한 일일 수도 있고요. 미국 증시의 역사는 이를 통계적으로 증명해주고 있는데요. 제2차 세계대전 이후에 미국 증시는 지난 77년간 총 14번의 베어 마켓을 경험했습니다. 베어 마켓이라고 하는 것은요. 여러분들 이제는 잘 알고 계실 텐데 미국 증시의 기본 잣대가 되는 S&P500의 주가 지수가 20% 이상 하락한 경우를 이야기합니다. 지난 77년간 미국 증시는 이런 베어 마켓을 약 5년에서 6년에 한 번씩 경험했다는 셈이고요. 그럼에도 불구하고 미국 증시의 이 변동성에 흔들리지 않고 시장에 계속 남아 있었던 투자자들에게 미국 증시는 연평균 10%라는 훌륭한 수입률로 보답을 해왔습니다. 결국 지금 우리가 경험하고 있는 이 하락장도요. 이러한 미국 증시의 역사의 한 페이지를 장식하게 될게 불명하고요. 가까운 미래에 우리가 지금 현재를 돌아보면 미국 주식을 팔 때가 아니라 그때 열심히 추가 매수했어야 하는데 하는 그런 생각이 드는 시점이 아닐까 합니다. 그런데 문제가 하나 있습니다. 만약에 지금이 미국 주식을 줍줍할 수 있는 좋은 기회라 해도 어떤 기업을 매수하냐에 따라서 우리가 누릴 수 있는 미래의 수익률은 천차만별 달라질 수가 있거든요. 그렇기 때문에 미존 채널에서는 한두 종목에 치우치지 않고요. 항상 가급적이면 다양한 기업에 대한 뉴스와 분석 영상을 만들어서 여러분들께 공유를 해드리고 있습니다. 그런 의미에서 오늘은요. 미존 패밀리 분들께 아주 좋은 뉴스 하나를 전달해 드릴 수 있게 됐습니다. 아무래도 저 혼자 수많은 기업에 대한 리서치를 진행하고 투자 종목을 발굴하는 데는 한계가 있을 수밖에 없잖아요. 하지만 오늘부터는 매달 한 번씩 베스트 바이라는 코너를 보내드릴 수 있게 됐습니다. 베스트 바이는 뭐 한국어로 하면 은 최고의 종목, 뭐 그달의 종목 이런 식으로 우리가 해석해 볼 수가 있는데요. 제가 아시아 총괄 대표로 일하고 있는 시킹 알파에는요. 시킹 알파와 파트너십을 구축하고 있는 수많은 주식 전문 블로거들이 있습니다. 그 규모가 어느 정도가 되냐면 약 7천 명이 넘는 수많은 주식 전문 블로거들이 매달 만 개가 넘는 아티클을 공유를 하면서요. 2천만 명이 넘는 시킹 알파의 사용자와 소통을 진행하고 있습니다. 그런데 이렇게 7천 명이나 되는 수많은 미국 주식 전문 블로거 중에서 최고의 블로거 한 분이요. 이번에 미중과 파트너십을 결성하게 됐습니다. 바로 앱 이코노미 인사이트라는 커뮤니티를 운영하고 있는 버틀란드라는 전문 투자자가 바로 그 주인공인데 이분은 현재 앱 이카나미 인사이트라는 유료 커뮤니티를 통해서 2만 7천 명이 넘는 유료 회원에게 미국 주식 종목에 대한 정보를 제공하고 있습니다. 그런데 앞으로 이 최고의 주식 전문 블로거 분이요. 미존 채널에 한 달에 한 번씩 등장하셔서 최고의 줍줍 기회가 찾아온 한 종목을 공개해 주시기로 했고요. 그뿐만이 아니라 해당 종목을 긍정적으로 평가하고 있는 이유에 대해서도 아주 상세한 프레젠테이션을 통해서 우리들에게 전달을 해 주시기로 약속을 받았습니다. 미존 패밀리 분들 입장에서는 요 버틀란드가 앞으로 추천해주고 있는 최고의 종목을 매달 한 종목씩 함께 공부해 볼수 있는 기회가 생긴 거고요. 버틀란드 입장에서는 30만 명이 넘는 미존 구독자 분들께 앱 이코노미 인사이트라는 서비스를 홍보할 수 있는 기회가 생긴 셈입니다. 그야말로 윈윈의 관계가 구축됐다 이렇게 말씀드릴 수가 있을 것 같습니다. 오늘은 그첫 번째 순서고요. 일단은 버틀란트라는 투자자가 그동안 최고의 종목을 발굴해내면서 성공적인 투자자로서 명성을 쌓을 수 있었던 그만의 비결을 함께 배워볼 시간을 준비해봤습니다. 자 그러면 미준에서 야심차게 준비한 베스트 바이 첫 번째 방송 바로 시작합니다. Hi, Bethlehem. How are you? Excellent, Charles. Thank you for having me on. Warmest welcome to Vision Channel. Thank you so much for sparing your precious time for me and the audience on my channel. I really appreciate it. Yeah, glad, glad to be here and have the opportunity to, uh, to talk about what I do on Seeking Alpha and uh, uh, share, share some e p i c o n o m y insights. Sure thing. Uh, it is uh, our first meeting. Please, can you kindly introduce yourself and your community called App Economy Insights to the audience? Absolutely. Yeah, um, I'm, a, I'm a visual kind of guy, so I, I have a few slides with me uh, so that I can uh, kind of show people a little bit about my background and uh, 
I get to learn more about our community. I'm going to share my screen. Um, so yeah, uh, to give people a little bit more detail about my background, I'm, um, my background is in finance. If you haven't noticed with my heavy accent, I'm originally from France, mm -hmm. where I was born and raised. And uh, after business school in France, I uh, used to work at PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, where I was uh, doing financial uh, audit. So mm -hmm. I was not specialized at the time. So I got to work with a lot of different industries, uh, which was very convenient to really get to learn how to read financial statements, uh, really understand what makes a business strong or weak, and uh, really put my hands in the dirt, if you will. But after a few years, I had the amazing opportunity to be poached basically by a, a large video game publisher, uh, Bandai Namco. If you're not familiar with Bandai Namco, they invented Pac-Man back in the, the 80s. Mm. Uh, more recently, they, they are the publisher behind uh, Elden Ring, which is a, a massive a game that was released last month that sold 12 million units in its first few weeks. Uh, so really a, a big success here. And uh, working in gaming has been really a, a blessing for me. It's been a fantastic industry to ride along and embrace the technology shift we've seen in the past 15 years. Gaming tends to be at the forefront of shifts. And so uh, for me, that was perfect because I grew a team here uh, of FP&A, which, uh, which stands for financial planning and analysis, and really grew a team that's focused on intelligence, investment strategy, and looking at business performance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, alongside this uh, career in gaming, uh, I grew a very strong interest for investing, uh, just like you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I expressed that with writing, basically. I, I decided to write in public to share my ideas, to kind of stress test what I care about and share with a community. So I started doing that on Seeking Alpha in the past few years, and uh, it really picked up uh, pretty fast. Grew a community of hundreds of uh, investors now. Uh, focus on the long term and all uh, around the topic, the, the theme of the app economy. And I'm going to touch on more why that's a theme that's so uh, important to me. So if you think about gaming, it is at the forefront of technology and how it's evolving. I'm showing here kind of the way gaming has evolved in the past 20 years. I always like to say that uh, it's evolved Similarly to, let's say, the movie business has shifted from, uh, you know, silent black and white movie to IMAX 3D over the course of maybe 50 years mm -hmm. for gaming that was over the course of 20 instead. So we, we moved from low resolution, well, Pac-Man is an example in the 80s, to a 4K, very high graphic fidelity. Uh, so that's a very obvious thing people have in mind when they think about how gaming has evolved. But the business itself has really dramatically changed in the past two decades. If you think about how it used to be a physical heavy business, you basically go to a shop, and you buy uh, either a cartridge or a physical disc. Um, in this day and age, the physical component of the business is less than 15%, maybe less than 10% of the console business. Uh, but there is more to that. The, the business has really shifted from console to uh, mobile. Now mobile represents more than half of the revenue made by the gaming industry at large. There is also an underlying way we target customers that has changed. It used to be you pay $60 maybe in the US for a game, a brand new game. Uh, today you can download an app for free and start playing right on your phone. So the way we cater to consumers' content has shifted from a premium transaction to a as-a-service mm -hmm. model where we really continue to interact with content and con instead of dropping the content all at once, it's steadily delivered over time for an experience that retains the user uh, as part of the ecosystem. Another fundamental aspect is how social gaming has become. Uh, now we play online, we meet others via gaming and it's even competitive, right? Because we used to play maybe in an arcade room just to have the best score in that very room on that machine. And today we play in global esports events in stadiums. I think I'm sure you've seen League of Legends and how popular like big games can be and competitive with, uh, with people competing online and sharing uh, their performance. 
Mm -hmm. So witnessing all this as a professional in the gaming industry has really truly be, been inspiring because it really made me try to think, okay, if this uh, shift that's happening in gaming has really improved the business fundamentals because now the way we acquire users is more efficient. The way we retain them, we monetize them is also better. The margins have improved. The scalability of the business has really improved. Instead of risking all of the investments we make in gaming on a day one release, we can gradually increase a community uh, with the as a service model. So there was a lot of things here that make, made the business more compelling. Mm -hmm. And I became really eager to find similar patterns beyond gaming in other industries, uh, because gaming was only one of many industries that would really shift to, to what I call the app economy, but really... Mm. Uh, the digital economy at large, right? Uh, it doesn't have to be mobile. It's the application economy in itself, the rise of the economy built around applications. Mm. And so when we think about the rise of the app economy, I started looking well beyond gaming across all sorts of things. Cable TV, broadcast TV has shifted now to Netflix or YouTube. We're on YouTube now, so that's a good example. Cash payments have shifted to mobile payments and uh, the use of Cash App and Venmo, for example, in the US. Taxi service shifted to right share. The rise of e-commerce, of course. Uh, matchmaking or meeting through friends that has become common with online dating, uh, with the stigma really getting uh, lower and lower. So I could go on with so many examples, but the implication as those industries shift to the app economy has been an improvement in the business fundamentals. And so what I've been so eager to find is what are the business that are going to ride this secular shift away from a pre-digital era to really like finding this scalable uh, nature. So there are five key patterns I have in mind when I think about businesses that have embraced the app economy. One is the scalability. So when you used to have to be on shelves, for example, at Walmart, uh, to be able to reach a consumer. Now the digital business can scale very fast, very quickly at a very cost efficient, in a very cost efficient way. Usually a digital business involves higher margins. And that's that's something, of course, we 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 keep in mind and that we want to see uh, uh, around, around business that thrive in the digital economy. Um, there is an explosion of data and it compounds over time because the more data you collect about users, about the way you can efficiently acquire, uh, you really improve the business over time. Uh, in gaming, again, we used to fly blind basically to spend millions of dollars in a TV ad without being able to capture more than just maybe seeing a small uptick and sell through units. Now we know exactly what users we want to target, where and when we want to target them. So th this really shows the sales efficiency has really dramatically changed. Recurring revenue is another fundamental aspect that I like to see because it improves the predictability of the business. Mm -hmm. I've been a forecaster as part of my professional career. It's an extremely difficult art to be able to anticipate trends and to forecast the future. Mm -hmm. So with recurring revenue, you get this comfort of having a good sense of the next year and the one after that. Mm -hmm. And in gaming, that has a lot of value because it can be all over the place uh, when you have no idea how a game is going to perform. It depends so much on, it's a hit-driven industry, if you will. So becoming like a subscription model, having a recurring revenue was much, uh, much better for us. And the, the final aspect is that migration to the cloud that we are seeing uh, where there is no need for a physical aspect, but also there is no need for a download Nobody needs to download the video we are on today. You can stream it on your phone. Uh, so that's obviously a, a fundamental aspect of the rise of the app economy. So there are six themes I want to point out that are part of uh, what I've built as part of a portfolio uh, built around the theme of the app economy. Uh, and those themes basically uh, encompass the, uh, the places where I have seen benefits that were similar to gaming and that really changed radically the way businesses make money and can really scale efficiently, gain that predictability and potentially unlock value for shareholders, right? Which is where we really step in as investors and we, we want to unlock that value. And so I won't go into too much detail here, but I, I will say 
I look for digital platforms at large, and that can be across gaming to an extent, but also uh, social platforms that benefit from network, network effects. I touched briefly on cloud migration. The companies that power the app economy here are at stake, and it can be involved in cybersecurity, big data, or what we call the API economy. So API stands for Application Interface Programming. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, when two software pieces of software talk to one another, uh, that, that's where the API economy uh, comes in. Maybe if you decide to click a button to share this video on Twitter, that would be part of the API economy, right? Global e-commerce, of course, with uh, the, the rise of, again, a shift where being in the right place at the right time already makes you makes your business a winner, surfing an important wave. With the rise, the explosion of data, we have the rise of artificial intelligence, which will be part of the theme we can discuss today uh, as part of a, a stock I, I will mention. Fin fintech disruption in general, just the, the way people are changing, the way they manage their finance digitally. And another important theme for me has been ad tech and uh, marketing technology, where because I've watched, I've witnessed it in gaming, where we can target users very differently and much more efficiently. Mm. And of course, this now applies to any type of business, but gaming was really at the forefront, changing the, the way they target users. So be, before we, we chat about a stock specifically uh, for, for this month, I wanted to, to cover the what and the how. Uh, first, the what with what I invest in. So what I look for, because virtually any business is digital today, right? So we want to find more than just a business that is embracing the digital economy, right? And so there are three categories I think about. So on the financial side, this one is the easiest one to cover because it shows in the numbers and we can all grasp the numbers very quickly. So businesses that are growing fast, meaning that show in their numbers that they are doing something right and that they are embracing that trend and, sh and really showing in their top line. Improving margins, we talked about scalability so it should reflect somewhere maybe lower marketing cost over time or efficiencies in the cost in the cost of goods so i would want to see margin expansion on top of a revenue growth because a lot of business can use growth what we call growth hacking right mm -hmm. anybody can make money let's say make revenue selling a one dollar bill for 90 cents uh, everybody would want to buy that but you, you have to find also a business that makes money out of that. And the balance sheet, very important. I think we, especially in the current environment, uh, businesses that cannot have a sustainable growth, uh, it's going to be a challenge. So we want to find businesses that can sustain their growth with their own uh, cash. And uh, strong unit economics is something that, to use a very simple example, ride sharing to this day is an important part of the, the app economy, but it's not a business I've been interested in. Uh, mm -hmm. Because at the unit level, those are businesses that struggle to make money, right? Mm -hmm. Once you pay the writer, once you pay gas, everything that needs to be covered, the unit economics. So at the unit level, you really don't see profitability. And so you can't offset bad unit economics with volume because you're losing a little bit of money every single time a transaction occurs. So mm -hmm. that's, I'm using a simple example here and, you know, ride sharing businesses could improve over time for other reasons. I just, I'm just using this as an example of how I think about it and how I look at it closely. Talking about product now. So it's very simple. I want a large opportunity so that there is an untapped potential, a uh, high ceiling, if you will. Optionality, which is uh, under optionality, we're talking about just several future potential that are uncapped. And so Amazon is the greatest example because they started as a book store mm -hmm. online and it then became a video entertainment app, but also uh, services for businesses to run to run online. So it became so much more than the initial premise. And mm -hmm. uh, in this day and age, you see a lot of businesses that have that are growing horizontally and vertically because of that this digital nature, right? So we want to see that in a company because it tells us that five, 10 years from now, they can they could be very different. So embracing a secular trend is what I, I was touching on. I want to be directionally correct. So if a business is embracing a trend that's supposed to go 2x, 4x, 6x in the next 10 years, mm -hmm. it, I put the stack the deck in my favor 
in terms of even an average business theoretically could succeed in a very mm. dynamic environment that is propelled forward. And the way I think about it is uh, I focus on the category leader. So in many of these areas, the, there it's not always a winner takes all, but it can be a winner takes most. So I don't want to miss that big chunk of the upside. And it's usually by focusing on the category leader that we guarantee that success. So I tend to focus on that. Especially when we talk about network effort. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, leader that takes uh, most of the part because of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, it becomes harder and harder for the second or the third one That's to correct. catch up. Mm -hmm. Right. And the final category on the right is management. So to put simply, I tend to favor founder led. Not all businesses need to be founder led, but when you have a founder at the top, uh, you, you have the CEO that's really aligned with shareholders. It's the project of their life. This is everything they care about. And so uh, it tends to be also uh, businesses tend to outperform the market when they are founder led. There are several uh, studies about that. So I, I tend to favor that. I see it as a plus, right? Yeah, sure. I cover uh, smart backers. So, you know, I always love to see smart investors backing a company I'm interested in because uh, they also put a lot of effort and research into identifying those winners. So it's really a way to outsource our research and to make sure that we we, so, we do some social proofing here mm -hmm. uh, where we try to identify businesses that are also identified by other investors that uh, think alike. Mm -hmm. uh, I, co I cover every quarter actually on Seeking Alpha. Uh, in an article, I look at all the quarterly reports from hedge funds, the, the best performing hedge funds that show where they invest their money, right? Because they need to disclose it on a quarterly basis. So yeah. mm -hmm. uh, at least following, keeping track of where that money is going and where those hedge funds are placing their bets for the next few years is an interesting data point. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's usually a great source of ideas for investors. I talk about the investing class leadership. Uh, it can be expressed through many uh, KPIs. I like to go uh, in the US here, we have Glassdoor or Comparably. Uh, mm -hmm. Those are great tools to just see how employees rate management. Uh, usually they say whether or not they would recommend mm -hmm. others to work at that company or if they approve management. So it, it comes from a simple premise, right? Would you really want to invest in a company where less than half of the employees would recommend to work there? I certainly wouldn't. So it's trying to be using a qualitative factor to eliminate uh, the weeds. Then we have high insider ownership. So finding, again, management that has skin in the game uh, that are exposed to their company and aligned with shareholders. Mm -hmm. And the final point is a strong track record of innovation. So it's seeing evidence in what we've witnessed over the past few years. Is there evidence that the business is reinventing itself uh, and not resting on its low roles? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So th that's been that's always something I want to see, because more likely than not, a business that keeps innovating will continue to do so in the future. You have so many uh, different uh, metrics, uh, which is very well set and organized. And I think it's a very impressive uh, list of the metrics. Do you have any different weight on each uh, metric or uh, is it evenly evaluated? What, what do you think are uh, most important uh, the, the metrics here, in your opinion? Um, I would say that I rarely find a business that will check all the boxes, right? Sure. And so, sure. so um, I try to picture it as the financials, for example. It's, uh, it's usually the things that will eliminate or be eliminating are a poor balance sheet because if... I cannot have guarantees on the sustainability. This one could be a sine qua non factor. Of course. In a similar way, some aspects such as a poorly reviewed management where act employees actively dislike management, that would be enough for me to say, I don't think I'm, I'm ready to invest, right? Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a case by case. I, I try to keep an open mind, right? Because all of these are important. But to your point, I would say, if there was a lead factor, I would say it's in the center of this slide and it's the product mm -hmm. because ultimately that's really what's going to drive the five to 10 years uh, story. So you could have financials that are a little bit trailing, a little bit behind because maybe something needs to be put to market and has yet to dem be demonstrated. But we need to have that opportunity, right? The large total addressable market has to be there. 
uh, it has to be a trend that we we understand can get behind because otherwise there there is it's a little bit too much of a, a story and uh I need, I need to see some evidence, right? Sure, makes sense. Great, thank you. And so a second idea on the what I look for that I wanted to briefly cover is, and I guess it touches on your question, which is what matters most? How do I balance it out? So I'm glad you asked because <laughs> I, I've, I've written an article on Seeking Alpha that I call the 60-30 rule of investing, the 60-30-10 rule. Mm. Uh, so it's try, I try to illustrate why investors tend to focus on the wrong things when they see an investment opportunity. And so I borrow from um, a decor theory or color theory. I don't know if you heard of this rule before. Uh, went, and you can see uh, a room here on, at the bottom. It shows the balance of colors that you're supposed to follow in, a, in decor, where 60% of a room will be your primary color or your dominant color. Then you have 30% on the texture or the secondary color uh -huh. and 10% on the accent, which is the, the last one, so the pink one here. Mm -hmm. And so I, to illustrate this approach that I have, I use the, the color theory balance to say, well, 60% should come from the business. So that's the, the central column from the previous slide, right? Yeah. That's what should drive the analysis and the research. Only then we can start looking at the financials. They matter, but they are not the primary source of uh, investment selection. And keep in mind those three tools because I'll touch on them uh, later on when we talk about a specific stock. So strength, scalability, and sustainability. Those are three factors that I look at in the financials. And finally, valuation. So it is the last point. It's only 10%. It's not exactly 10%. It's just the, my way of saying this is the last step. The previous 90% have to be covered before we start looking at valuation because uh, it's a simple premise, right? If something is cheap, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to buy it if I don't need it, right? If you mm -hmm. go on Amazon or wherever you go, mm -hmm. evaluate the, the price of something is somewhat irrelevant if you don't need it or if you, you wouldn't uh, want to have it to begin with. Exactly. So, yeah. so many people look at the stock price first. They try to gauge something out of that or they look at the valuation of a company and if it's cheap, they are interested. I try to flip that on its head and really uh, flip the table and say, well, no, that should be your last step. You need to have covered everything else first. Uh, so uh, that, that's a, a good way for me to, to show how I think about those things. So that was the what. And after that, there is the how. And I think we need to cover the how because I, I know, Charles, you're focused on the long term. And uh, it, it's an aspect that needs to be mentioned here because investing in a secular trend can only work if you're willing to expand your time horizon and expecting, you know, it's like expecting a tree to grow from a seed after a year or two, you're going to be disappointed, right? Or maybe if you're working out and you're expecting to look very different after a week or two, you're going to be disappointed too. Mm -hmm. And in investing, it works pretty much the same way, right? So investing like a business owner, a simple hack is, uh, I call it buy right and sit tight, right? Which is just buy quality and accept that you will have to give it a long time to let it materialize over time and to let a story unfold. So we talked about the 10% on valuation. It is important. It is there. I mentioned don't overpay. So once you find that investment you care about and you want to build, wait for it to be opportunistically relevant. And the two last points is more on portfolio strategy. Uh, it's uh, adding water. It's, I borrow from Peter Lynch here to say, what are your flowers and trim your weeds? So build up your positions in your winners and limit uh, your exposure and eventually cut your losers. When you talk about the long-term uh, horizon, uh, what would be the typical year um, of investment? How many years? Yeah, um, I, I like to say five to 10 years is it would be a, a minimum for me. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, not everybody has that time frame, right? But in general, uh, investing for less than five years uh, is, is a bit of a coin flip in terms of seeing results. And so I, ideally, a minimum of five, I wouldn't want to invest in stocks for less than five years. Uh, that would be the bare minimum. Ideally, as long as you possibly can, right, is the, the uh, Warren Buffett likes to say the ideal holding period is forever, right? So mm -hmm. uh, ideally much more. And, and just to conclude on the how, I, I have an article on Seeking Alpha covering four rules I use for portfolio strategy. And these, we don't need to go into details, but they are just uh, 
tricks I use to uh, remove emotions from my process. And so, especially these days, you know, with growth stocks, most of them are down 30, 40, sometimes 60% from their highs. And so the, the way I think about it is I don't try to time the market. So I invest a fixed amount every month that I share with the community. That's, that's the first one, because by doing so, I invest at market tops and market bottoms. But even if uh, I will never have a horrible timing, because mm -hmm. even if I invest at the top, it was only, you know, one twelfth of what I'm going to invest that here mm -hmm. uh, in a given month. The second rule is to define a max allocation. So people tend to see a stock, let's say they invested $1,000, that stock has dropped by 50%. It's only 500 now. So they feel like, oh, if I want to have $1,000 exposed, let's add another 500. And they are willing to add to losers this way. So the way to think about max allocation is to really think in terms of your cost basis, how much money was already allocated to a given investment so that you have that maximum you're willing to throw at one single idea mm. and avoid, um, let's say, defining a max that you can afford to, to put on one company and not go beyond that. But your portfolio uh, will eventually grow as time goes. What would be the maximum percentage of one stock you invest? So I found this is a very good question and I found the right balance for me to be at about 8%. 8%. So this is the amount I would be willing to add uh, from a cost basis perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's the equivalent of having 12 stocks balanced perfectly in a portfolio, right? 12 times 8% would get you up to uh, close to um, 100%. However, I would have no problem letting that 8% investment grow into a much larger portion of my portfolio. So uh, if I was, if a stock grows to 16, 20, 25%, I would have no problem with that. And that's the rule number four, basically, of not selling your winners or uh, letting your winners run. Warren Buffett, you know, is known for having like almost half of this portfolio in Apple, right? And that's because it's a, it's, it's his best performing investment, right? And so I don't want to go above 8% from an allocation, a starting allocation perspective, but I have no ceiling in terms of how much a position can grow into. Mm -hmm. And it comes from something we call the power law or uh, the Pareto rule, right? Where 20% of your investment are going likely to drive 80% of your returns. So they are immensely important and cutting them as they grow, as they compound in your portfolio would be a terrible mistake, right? So they, in theory, a portfolio should concentrate in the very biggest winners uh, over time. Mm -hmm. And trying to go against that is actually like breaking compounding, hurting your portfolio return potential. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's how I think about uh, keeping a reasonable portfolio allocation on a cost basis, but letting the portfolio concentrate for me with, through, through sheer performance. Mm. That sounds uh, uh, easy to talk, but actually in actual situation, uh, it could be very challenging because uh, once you find your winners, it means the valuation or multiple can go up. So uh, you feel like it's more risky, but... Um, you have to overcome that fear, right? <laughs> That's exactly right, Charles. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I like to think that over maybe a short period, like six months, multiple expansion can drive a stock performance. Mm -hmm. So we can borrow from Ben Graham, who says in the short term, the stock market is a voting machine, right? Long term, it's a weighing machine. Yeah. Uh, ultimately, business fundamentals are going to drive stock performance, right? So the market is buying more of a stock because they recognize that it's a superior business. So over a one year time frame, yes, but over a five to 10 year time frame, uh, a stock should grow because business fundamentals justify it. Mm -hmm. And as a result, we should feel comf more comfortable about having a larger allocation to that st stock because it is a winner, meaning it has demonstrated its success. It has shown evidence of its success. Certainly. Yes. Great. And so, yeah, just to touch on the, the time horizon you mentioned. So um, this is something that we always want to keep in mind over one year. Investing in stocks is almost like a coin flip, right? You could go up 51% or down 37%. That's from 
uh, historical performance for, for the past uh, 80 years or so. Mm. And so tr- I've seen, you know, investors start investing um, maybe in, 2000, uh, in 2021 and see like uh, we touched on it, the growth stocks go down and maybe almost 40% on average. So that's exactly where we are. Mm. Um, but, you know, I've, I've started my portfolio focused on the app economy in 2014. And so I'm seeing close to 20% annual return. So I'm closer to this area right there. But on a year-to-year basis, it can go all over the place, right? So recognizing that is the key to expanding your time horizon so that you can play the game on your own terms, right? So it's, it's like deciding what are the rules of the game, you want to play. So why would you play a game that is like a coin flip when you can actually move to a 10 year or 20 year time frame where the odds of making money are higher and higher the longer the time frame. Yeah, so which means if we set a short period of time as an investment, you have a chance to have a very big gain, but you also have a, a another chance to lose a lot. But as time goes, and then when you have a longer term view, um, yes, of course, the, the average gain is reduced comparing to one year investment, but it's getting more safer. And also the, the percentage is still very satisfactory because I would say 19% gain is uh, quite a lot. That's right. It's on the high end of the spectrum. It can go from plus 19 to minus one here in the, the example of the 10 year time frame. And yeah, in the 2000s, for example, we had a lost decade, right? If you invested in Microsoft or the S&P 500 in 2000, you the market went sideways for 10 years, right? Yes. So something like that could happen again, you know, in the 2020s. Mm. Uh, and so that, that's also why I go back to the slowly dipping your toes, right? Investing a steady amount every month. That's what works for me mm. because I know that even if I have at some point a bad timing like that in the last decade, uh, it's only going to affect a portion of the capital I invested and uh, won't have dramatic consequences. And so... Just to to move on to uh, something I wanted to share with, uh, so the premium service I'm running on Seeking Alpha have, every month has a, a big deep dive on the first of the month where I really try to cover everything I just mentioned today, but specific, covering a specific company. And I invest my own money in the company uh, at that same time. And of course, I've built a quite large portfolio over time. And so what I do on the 15th of the month is I cover uh, usually six stocks that I believe are where I would want to invest money today if I was ready uh, to invest. Mm-hmm. And usually I also share live trade alerts. So every month I add money to the portfolio and I pick among those six stocks to add to my positions. Mm-hmm. So they are usually selected based on just their business momentum. Are they currently on the low end of their valuation spectrum so that they give actually decent chance of high returns over time? So it has to be a combination of those things Mm -hmm. so that there is still evidence of their success, but also they are opportunistically interesting to invest in. And it, yes, it comes along um, a portfolio tracker where I share basically all my positions uh, in real time compared to the the market. And we cover earnings and things like that. three you know four times a year we get to really get signal as opposed to noise we get to see the business performance so earnings is something i cover every time to kind of uh, be up to date with um, the trend and if if the investment is still relevant or not all right so for today if if that works for you charles i wanted to cover one of the six stocks that are part of the best buys now this month and that that stock is uipath <music> 